Hey guys, Crib and Gavinder from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I've got a background in food science and today I have an amazing guest. I've been wanting to speak to this wonderful lady for such a long time and finally the stars have aligned and we're having this conversation, long-awaited conversation. Yelena Vulovic, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kriben. It's a pleasure to be here. It is true. It's been over a year, over a year I think, that we've been trying to arrange this date. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much. And what I'd like to, to get at the start of the show, Yelena, is straight from the horse's mouth, who is Yelena Vulovic? So I'm, uh, first of all, I'm a mother. Uh, I think that's the most important job in my life. Uh, but I'm a gut microbiologist. Uh, that's what I did my PhD in. Uh, I spent 12 years at the academ doing academic research, and then I transitioned into industry, uh, working for about eight or nine nine years and then four and a half years ago I decided to join in with my long-term work partner George Georges and we formed a company called uh, Vermico. Um, so that's really the the shortest introduction of who I am. Great what a way to start the show I'm just going to throw a little bit of a curveball at you when I say the word Nikola Tesla what does that mean to you? It means it's a name I've had since I was a kid. I was born in uh, the country that used to be called Yugoslavia in Sarajevo. So I'm Bosnian and I came to the uh, to London in uh, UK uh, in 1992 as a result of the war there. So Nikola Tesla, obviously, being born in the same country where I was, was a big name when I was growing up and a name I've heard from my grandparents and then throughout the school. And I hope everybody in the world has heard that name because he's an important guy, not just because of the car that Elon Musk invented, but of many other things that he's done. Yes, yeah, certainly Nikola Tesla is a, an immense inspiration for myself and the amazing work that he's done. So hopefully as scientists, we can be somewhat in <laughs> a fraction of the, the the shoes that that Nicola wore. And Yelena, I think I've been following your work on LinkedIn for some time. That, that's how we particularly met. But you, you've been involved in quite a few studies when it comes to the gut microbiome. And I'd like to start the show off because I think – Many people struggle with some sort of connection between the gut microbiome and the immune system. So how does the gut microbiome influence our immune system? So the first of all, I'd like to say the difference between the microbiome and the microbiota, because I find it a little bit annoying when I, when I read <laughs> things. So the microbiome is the collection of genes of the microbiota, which are living organisms uh, present in this case in our gut, but not only in our gut, literally everywhere on and around us. Um, so the microbiota, um, which is probably the term I'll use most of all, because that's what refers to the guys that are living and there, uh, is really not only influential uh, when it comes to the immune system, but also they are the main guys that manage the immune system throughout our lives. So when we're born, we don't have the immune system. Uh, we get what we need from mother's milk, if we're lucky and we're breastfed. Um, we get lots of things from the environment. And of course, today, all the new formulas will try and introduce as many things as possible to help that immune system and help the protection. So especially during those 40 days of life when we don't have the immune system, it's the microbiota, uh, which is inside our guts, that's really driving the protection uh, mainly of the infant against everything that can go wrong and then so that's where it all starts and then throughout the life the microbiota manages and is constantly involved and interacts with the immune system in a good and in a bad way which depends obviously on 
our microbiota makeup, but then on everything else, you know, who we are, where we are, what we eat, and so on. So the connection between the two is very strong and very real, and they cannot really be split into two, even though they are two different entities, they, they constantly interact. Right. And very early in your your journey, you did some work with ulcerative colitis. Now, a lot of people struggle with ulcerative colitis. So firstly, how about we define the term? And then what are your key takeaways and findings from the work that you've done on ulcerative colitis? So ulcerative colitis is actually the reason why I decided to study microbiota. Because in 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 the last century, in 1995, when I was a student, uh, I read, well, I read some works from Hippocrates, but then that led me towards a few other things. And then I found studies from a Japanese group whose name I can't remember now, I do apologize to them, um, from 1980s, beginning of 1980s, where they looked at certain components from the microbiota, and these specific components uh, could be involved in colorectal carcinogenesis, but first of all, through the uh, um, initiating some inflammatory responses that are um, resembling ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel condition, one of the two, the other one is Crohn's and the only difference, well, not the only difference, but the main difference between them is the location. Um, and it's a lifelong disease. Uh, we don't have any treatment really. So the treatments are always uh, just the management of symptoms. Uh, which are uh, related to um, standard things like GI symptoms, maybe pain, bloating, and so on, but also bloody diarrhea. Uh, it's not good to have it. And there's a very, there, there isn't really, it isn't really known what starts the ulcerative or how it starts the ulcerative colitis, but there's a very strong link between the genetics. So you do need to be genetically predispositioned um, between the inappropriate response of the immune system and inappropriate uh, microbiota uh, makeup. Now, whether the microbiota reacts to whatever happens within the body uh, in terms of the immune system and is therefore not so good, or it's the other way around, is the question I've had for almost 30 years and I'm still unable to answer. And that's not just the case with the ulcerative colitis, but very many things. Though I have changed my mind about the microbiota from where I was 30 or 20 years ago to where I am today and how I see it um, within the human body. And you mentioned the difference between these two conditions being the location. So how about we delve a little bit deeper into the locations of those two, two diseases? So the ulcerative colitis always starts uh, at the rectal region and it uh, uh, extends distally from, from the rectum um, towards upwards into the colon. Whereas um, Crohn's disease could really appear anywhere within the gastrointestinal tract and it can be patchy. It doesn't have to be all in a continuous, affecting a continuous region of the gut, but you can get it all over, even in your mouth. Uh, so that makes treatment of Crohn's disease somewhat more difficult than ulcerative colitis, but they're equally uh, difficult uh, to treat and to manage symptoms. And what options do people have in terms of alleviating some of those the symptom, symptoms associated with those diseases? There are some standard medical treatments, um, though I'm always on the side of the lifestyle, a modification of the lifestyle that includes diet, obviously. So removing, uh, because a lot of people who have ulcerative colitis or any form really of gastrointestinal disorder will be or will eventually become as a result of their condition intolerant uh, to various uh, environmental uh, pollutants factors, including dietary components. So removal of those, recognition of those and then removal of them is always a good way forward. Um, things that obviously modulate the microbiota because microbiota, even though we don't know which way 
um, the road is going is influential. There's plenty of evidence out there that uh, uh, not only the symptoms, uh, the GI symptoms, but also the inflammation and the, the amount of inflammation that enters the body and more importantly, the intestinal barrier, which is really the key, in my opinion, today, as opposed to what I thought 20 years ago, um, can be influenced. Uh, heavily and is actually influenced only by the microbiota. Uh, so uh, a lot of things like prebiotics and probiotics and postbiotics today are things that people need to uh, try. Um, the only issue there is that there are so many things out there in the market and we are all so different. So very often, as it is the case with any condition, uh, there would have to be a lot of trial and error trying things and then finding out what works for you. And I really have to uh, say something here that, uh, you know, we live, in, we live in a world where everybody expects things to happen yesterday. Well, when you deal with the gut, such a dynamic and a huge environment, it is impossible really to expect things to happen overnight. So I always tell people that when you start something, give it at least a month, but ideally, three months if you want to deal with huge things such as inflammation before you make a decision, oh, well, this is good for me or not. Obviously, from the beginning, let's say after the, during the first week, most people can experience symptoms that aren't very good. But if they continue into week two or three and they really trouble some, then of course, I mean, that's not the product for you. But to, to decide it's good or not, you've got to give it more than just a, few days or even few weeks. That's so true, Yelena, because it, it takes, and imagine it takes some time to develop these problems, perhaps even a, a lifetime of poor choices. And then we have this expectation that we're going to solve the pro problem by taking a, a pill or some sort of intervention. But I, I completely agree with you. That is so true. I have so many questions. The, the first obvious question is you mentioned that these dysfunctions are a combination of genetic factors, but also certain microbiota. Is there a particular signature of organisms that you found in your studies that could be used as a perhaps a, a marker in future? So if you asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have told you yes. Um, there are certain markers and it is still true there are certain markers and in the last especially in the last 10 years so much work has been done with microbiota and the microbiome so of course there's a, there are a lot of things we can take out of there however um, where I stand firmly today uh, based on well my work and my experience is that it is impossible to define healthy microbiota. So what comprises healthy microbiota is a basic question that I've spent so many years and how many people spend so many years and we still can't answer that basic question. What comprises healthy microbiota? Because microbiota is influenced by so many different things. And then there's the human who's also influenced by all those different things. And then the interaction of the two that is also complex. So until we can um, answer that question, what comprises healthy microbiota, all the um, biomarkers that we currently have are useful. And in some cases are not only useful, but we can rely on them. But to apply that knowledge to a population level or to every single person that's suffering with any kind of disorder or a disease is very, very difficult because we've seen, I'm sure you've read, I've seen it in my own hands, uh, taking people who on paper look identical in terms of their genetics and their background, their diet, lifestyle and so on, and yet, they have completely different microbiota. I have worked with people with ulcerative colitis whom I followed for a year. And I took their samples, their stool samples, and analyzed their microbiota every month over a year. And 
during that one year, even in that same person where everything was controlled, including the treatment and the diet and everything else, they had very, very different um, microbiota makeup. So I would have to say that, you know, it's, it's a difficult question to answer and I, and I wouldn't be able to tell you, well, X, Y, Z is good. However, we do know that certain members of the microbiota are beneficial. So you want to try and increase those with the diet and lifestyle and addition of functional food ingredients. And then we also know that certain lifestyle um, and certain components of the diet are bad. So obviously you want to keep those uh, uh, down, such as you know high fat diet or eating too much meat or not exercising or smoking or drinking too much and so on. But I think most people probably know that without needing an expert. Mm -hmm. That that's an amazing insight coming from such a such a, a key researcher in the field, and you know it's it's very humbling to to uh, to make that statement that we we don't know enough yet. But it's it is a it's still a nascent field. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's still a nascent field, and it will take some time, I think, to peel back some of the layers and, and get more insights into how these our body genetics, our microbiota react and how we can solve some of these problems in future. So I, I think this, sorry, keep going. If I, if I can interrupt there, I do think, because I was some five years ago when I came to this realization, I asked my question, I asked myself a question, okay, so what do I do? I've spent all these years trying to modulate the microbiota, looking for the healthy microbiota in order to exert a benefit onto a human. And now I've come to this realization that I'm never going to answer that question. So what do I do? I give up and do something else or what do I do? There is an option. And, and I do think one day we will answer that question. It's just that that, no, that day is not today. And, and I don't think it will be in the near future. However, there is, there is a lot that we can do because microbiota is influential. We know a lot about it. So the thing that we can do and the thing that I've decided to do with George is to extract the benefit from the microbiota and bypass the need to change it, bypass the need to um, even, I don't want to change, I don't want to say bypass the need to change the lifestyle because we should all try to have a balanced lifestyle, but, but at least help a little bit that need where if you're, if you're going and trying to modify the microbiota, you don't really have to change your lifestyle as well in order to get the, uh, the real benefit. So bypass the need of all of that, not worry so much about the microbiota, but concentrate on the human, concentrate on the tolerance because it's, it's very simple. Um, it doesn't really matter what's microbiota. It doesn't matter what's the environment. If us humans and our um, immune system can tolerate whatever comes our way. So if we can increase that tolerance, then we can uh, manage a lot more than we're able to do if our tolerance level is down. And we can do that by extracting the beneficial compounds from the microbiota that we know and have been around for a long time and bringing them back into the human body without the need to interact with the microbiota. And I think that's the way forward. That's what postbiotics are. And that's where we decided to concentrate on. And I do believe that's the new frontier in gut health. And I don't want to say the only one, it's not the only one because all the others obviously have their space and, and an important one, but it is the, the, the new one, the one that could bring the whole of gut health together and not just one component, which is microbiota. I'm so pleased that you brought that up, Yelena, because it is absolutely on point with the way my thinking is in this current this current time place and time. I, I think it's really about the metabolites that these these microbiota produce and then you're in your work trying to replicate some of these metabolites and then using them as a almost a personalized nutrition tool so firstly i think the audience might not be familiar with a postbiotic 
certainly I think probiotics and prebiotics have become very trendy. So people get that. But what is a postbiotic? So there are a few definitions and there's some controversy with those definitions, you know, depending on where you look. But put in simple words, a postbiotic is what a probiotic produces when they eat a prebiotic. It's um, or or any any other food. So it's a uh, um, beneficial compounds that uh, probiotics produce, and those are produced daily in our guts. They're also produced in fermented foods like yogurt or kimchi and all the rest. Uh, so that's really what postbiotic is. It's the metabolites or the end products or however you want to call them. Now some definitions say that. Postbiotic must also contain dead components of bacteria or other uh, microorganisms, but I think that's that that's going into into real scientific details and and maybe not that important. I love that simple definition. I think it it serves the the word postbiotic very well. People might be familiar with things like butyrate, but one that you're certainly an expert on is a compound called beta goss. So how about we jump into that rabbit hole and explore beta goss a little bit more. So firstly, what is beta goss and how is it made and what are the benefits? That's, there's a lot of questions there, so we can go slow. Okay, so B, B goss or beta goss, uh, uh, as you say, which is correct, is actually a prebiotic. It's not a postbiotic. So it's a prebiotic. There are lots of prebiotics on, on, on the market, not just on the market. There are lots of prebiotics in foods. The, the beta galactoligosaccharides, that's the short um, or the longer version of GOS. Um, in my opinion, I have spent a lot of time working with all sorts of prebiotics, um, natural, synthetic, and however you want to uh, call them. Um, beta gosses, which naturally don't really occur in anything other than breast milk, human breast milk we're talking about here. And even then, it's the, the, they structurally resemble some components of uh, um, human breast milk oligosaccharides, which are extremely complex and change throughout the day, even throughout the feed of the baby. So they are the closest, um, structurally closest to human milk oligosaccharides. So they are the best immunomodulatory prebiotics that you can have because of what they do in human uh, breast milk. Now, as opposed to fructooligosaccharides, for example, which or fossils, which uh, most people are probably familiar with, uh, that are one single structure, galactooligosaccharides are a mixture of, of um, varying uh, oligosaccharides of varying uh, length and also chemical uh, structure. And this chemical structure that they have depends on the origin of the enzyme, so from which bacterium they are produced. And that is a key in their functionality, meaning how they're going to behave when they arrive into your gut and how they're going to interact with my, not only microbiota, because all prebiotics um, or well-designed prebiotics will support the official components of the microbiota influence the um, diversity and all that. All prebiotics will do that. But these specific prebiotics or certain components of their structure will also interact directly with immune cells. And that interaction will depend on the chemical structure and chemical structure depends on the origin of the enzyme. So most commercial um, gosses come from one strain of bacilli, um, which is all right as a prebiotic. But a better idea is to take actually um, enzymes from a probiotic, such as bifidobacterium. Lots of people have heard of it. We have plenty of evidence out there that these guys are good. Um, because we then not only uh, select uh, for their growth and increases their increase in your own gut, 
Uh, but we also then bring about a lot of other benefits that those bacteria have early on and their interaction with the immune system. So we've worked previously with um, gosses, and I, and I just have to add something here because a lot of people call galactoligosaccharides things that come from soya beans, for example. But those are not uh, galactoligosaccharides I'm talking about. Um, because soya beans, galactoligosaccharides are actually something very, very different structurally. Um, so we've worked previously with uh, galactoligosaccharide by Muno, uh, and this time we have developed a different one, which is also from bifidobacterium, but from bifidobacterium breve, because by Muno is from bifidobacterium that's dominant in infants, and this time we have chosen a bacterium that's dominant in adults. Um, that gives it a little bit more, a lot more, I would say, um, benefit when it comes to adult population and its interaction with the immune system. So those are prebiotics, very special prebiotics, probably, or in my opinion, the best ones in the market. If that's what you're after and you want a prebiotic, go for transgalact oligosaccharides or beta acids. In what situation would someone consider using a beta GOS? Using B GOS? Yeah. So you could, if you, if you're, look, we, we all, none of us have a perfect lifestyle. I've never met a person who has a perfect lifestyle. So I think everyone should take some form of a functional food ingredient which does not necessarily have to be beta gos. Um, but then people who suffer with uh, gastrointestinal disorders, such as IBS, for example, would benefit from something. For anybody who wants to improve their uh, their own probiotics, give them a bit of a kick in the gut. Uh, it is a substrate to take. Great. The the connection just dropped off a little bit there. So perhaps you could repeat that. What what is the benefits of beta goss? I think the last point you made was around something around the immune system. But I think we we better repeat that section. So the, the beta gosses, well, um, for uh, anyone can use them, as I said. Uh, anyone who wants to support a little bit more their lifestyle and support their own probiotics that are already in their gut uh, and give them a little bit more kick when it comes to the immune system. But more specifically, people who suffer with uh, gastrointestinal um, disorders such as IBS, or want to treat similar symptoms. So ulcerative colitis is one of them, could also benefit from uh, beta gosses. Uh, but we do have an upgraded product, which is a postbiotic. Um, and that's, that's something else. That is a real postbiotic, not just prebiotic uh, uh, compounds that actually interact with us humans and not the microbiota. The thing I said earlier in our chat. Amazing. I think Zoom is just about to kick us out. So how about we pause and then I'll send you a link to join again in a sec. Okay. Yeah. We'll be, ba yeah. be back in a sec. Thank you.